we're going to talk about the uh, ICU now, um, which is the intensive care unit. Um, maybe a different, slightly different acronym over in the States and other countries, um, but uh, obviously ICU for, for here. I vaguely remember coming round um, in the ICU. I remember my mum and wife being there. Um, and I remember the, the thing that I was trying to do, which is crazy considering a procedure you've just had and, and your emotions are all over the place. I wanted to make sure that they knew I was all right. You know, I wanted to make sure I was like trying to crack a joke and I was kind of like sign language in, I heart you and all this sort of stuff. Um, obviously high on drugs, high on life or whatever else, but um, I remember having that thought in my mind to make sure that my family were okay, which is crazy because you, you know, you've just gone through this procedure, they're there for you, you know, they want to look after you and the sort of person I was, you know, I just wanted to make sure that they knew I was all right. Um, the main issue I had um, in the early hours, I think it was, in ICU, um, was the tube down the throat. Now, I've historically, so when I had my tonsils out when I was a, a toddler and when I had my first surgery, heart surgery, um, in 97, it was really difficult for them to bring me round um, from the anaesthetic. I was really groggy, really tired, and they couldn't bring me round. And until they do that, the breathing tube is down your throat. You know, they say to you, they, you know, they kept on telling me, I don't really remember too much of this, but they were telling me a lot of the time, you know, you've got to stay awake. We won't take the tube out until you, you can stay awake for a period of time and, and kind of breathe on your own and you, you with it a bit more. And obviously I wasn't doing that. I was kind of passing in and out of uh, consciousness or, you know, awake and asleep. Um, but every time I was awake, I was just really irritable because I could feel this tube down my throat and um, I was struggling at times. Apparently I was like like lifting my uh, knees up to my chest as I was trying to um, struggle and they were kind of trying to pin me down a bit, uh, which is, you know, worrying. I don't remember any of this. I remember being in discomfort during certain times with the tube, but not for the duration that this this went on for. And they were getting a bit concerned. And at one point, I think where I was struggling and they were trying to move the tube, um, it um, hit all the way down the back of my throat. So they had to get um, a camera to uh, look down it to make sure they hadn't damaged anything. And they could see where it had gone down, but I don't think there was any lasting damage. So they were they were quite kind of quite happy to to continue with as it was. And obviously, I got to a point um, of that evening. So it was around. I don't know, half past five in the afternoon, six o'clock. It was a long, long procedure, really, really long. Um, the actual operation in, in terms of, you know, putting a valve in, doing the heart work, the real, you know, the, the good stuff. Um, I think that was fairly routine um, in terms of duration, um, but it was the opening, which I was told about, um, and then the closing and, and things like that, that actually took the time um, and what have you. So. Yeah, obviously I, I stayed awake long enough for a period of time that they were able to take the uh, the tube out, the breathing tube. And I don't remember much, um, really, that night. Um, I kept on coming round. And every time you go into a deep sleep with sort of the anaesthetic and being on morphine, you go to sleep hard. That's the only way I can describe it. You sleep so hard that when you wake up, you think I must have slept today, but it's literally it's 10 minutes, it's 20 minutes. Um, and it just makes that first night for me, it felt so long in ICU. It just felt like it went on forever. You know, I kept on coming back round. Um, I think there was, there were four ICU bays in my area of the ICU. Um, and there was obviously a, um, a patient in each one of those. Not that I was really aware of what else was going on. Um, but I had a huge bay, absolutely huge. It was just my bed. Next to my bed, there was like a row of cabinets with all that sort of medication and dressing and whatever else was needed. And then to the left of the bed, there was like a, a, like a nurse's desk. Um, and there was a nurse there, an ICU nurse. And I'm probably doing a disservice to what they're actually called because they're absolutely brilliant. They are there just for you. It's one-to-one -one healthcare. Um, you flinch, you move, you twitch, they're there. 
like what what can we do how can we help and for me it was i was so thirsty i needed needed to drink and they couldn't give me any water i was on a um i was on a drip um so i was getting fluids so uh, the rest of the body was fine i was hydrated but my mouth i just remember being so dry and i'm not sure how long it lasted um in terms of uh keep asking it might have been um, a few minutes a few hours you lose all sense of time but after a while um the nurse who was looking after me he was able to uh, give me like a damp sponge it was like on the end of a stick and i was kind of like swilling it around in my own mouth and i just could remember how like thick with whatever was in my mouth and and lips and stuff and the water just wasn't cutting it at all it just it was doing nothing and it was like leaving a horrible aftertaste and that was probably the most uncomfortable part of the the night really was just how thirsty and you start dreaming about drink you know um for me i don't i'm not a big fizzy drink drinker i was lying there dreaming of coca-cola thinking of something that would cut through whatever was going on in my mouth i needed something to cut through that wasn't water on a stick or whatever so uh yeah that was probably the worst bit about it i was on um these icu like air beds and they were like constantly sort of massaging and moving and changing throughout the throughout the period which was really good so throughout the night they were like making sure you were like not getting bed sores or, or whatever else not that you could probably get them that quickly but they were just making sure that you know they were you know your blood was circulating whatever they do i'm sure there's more technical things that they do than that but it was just really good i remember getting um turned on my side twice and they cleaned um and made sure i was all clean and dry down the back um and you know so to clean away any sweat or anything else like that which was really good really attentive but again i don't think i got much sleep um, that wasn't just kind of like passing in and out of consciousness it wasn't sort of natural sleep as i would call it um it seems like i say it seemed to go on forever um but then the kind of day breaks um shift changes and i had this um lady nurse um switch over i think i want to say it was about eight o'clock in the morning but it may have been a little bit earlier um she came in and first thing she done so she won me over straight away she gave me a cup of water um, but it was probably the right time for it you know if the other guy was there he probably would have uh, given me water as well so i had a you know probably half a cup of water and then that was it they were like right we're going to get you up out of bed and i was like I'm not sure about this you know i've got you know i still had chest strains coming out of me i had tubes i had um everything coming out of my neck that were in the central line um i had drips here there and everywhere but this is what they want to do. They want to get you out of bed as quick and as easy as they can. And I just thought, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to argue. I'm not going to protest. I feel like crap, but I'm just, just go with it. You, you're the experts. Um, so it probably took three, two or three people to kind of get all the, uh, the tubes and the drains round to the right side of the bed, um, to get the bed position, to get the chair, uh, and all of that and to really kind of hoist me up out of bed and you are manhandled woman handled whatever you want to call it there's no two ways about it they are moving you you're not doing too much of it yourself you don't have much of the strength you're in pain all the way up your incision but it wasn't like an unbearable pain but as soon as I was sat up and I was on the end of the bed I just said I'm going to be sick um they didn't get a bucket to me in time it went everywhere it was green if you want a you know a graphic image of, of what it was um and it was just kind of a bit of the water that i'd obviously just drunk um but mainly it was the anesthetic um and i had a then i had sort of like one of those cardboard bucket tray things and i was in the chair probably i was sick a couple of times afterwards um it, to be honest it doesn't actually hurt that much considering you know the surgery you've just had um but it just it it feels like bottom you know you're sat in this chair feeling like absolute garbage throwing up green stuff in so much pain and discomfort you are at rock bottom there is no other way of saying it um 
and everyone around you, all of the staff, know it's going to get better. You know, you kind of know, you hope, you hope it's going to get better, but they know it. They've seen it, you know, just trust them, trust the process, follow what they tell you to do, and you will feel better. But at that time, you know, I was sat there shriveled up in his chair, clutching his cardboard bowl, and I, it was it was bottom you know there's there's no other way of saying it it was absolute bottom you know you can't feel any worse than that and that's for me was kind of good you know that's that's as bad as you're going to feel every minute after that you hopefully you're going to get better i was probably sat in that chair for i don't know an hour or so it felt longer i just felt uncomfortable no matter what angle they put the chair at it just felt awful um the surgeon came to see me, which was really good, Professor Shaw. Um, he came round, um, I've probably only been in a chair 10 minutes. And yeah, he came round to talk to me about the procedure. He was really happy with how it went. Uh, they were able to put the stent into the artery, widened it, um, and they were able to put in, I believe it was a 26 uh, millimeter um, St. Jude mechanical valve. So he's really happy with how um, big a valve they're able to put in there, which obviously helps um, in the long run. So that if um, naturally, if your heart gets bigger, um, the, the valve might be um, seated incorrectly or whatever. They just prefer to put as big a valve in as possible um, that hopefully will then outlast me for obviously for the duration of my life, which, you know, is fantastic news that they're able to do that. Um, he didn't really talk too much about the um, procedure. He was very matter of fact, as these uh, these surgeons are. Um, he was happy with how um, it went. He was happy that I was in a chair, even though I felt like crap. Um, and he was one of the ones that just says, look, it gets better. You know, you feel like this now, trust us. You know, the fact that you're out and you're, you're sat down is, you know, is really good. He did mention, he did say to me, he said, um, he asked if I worked out, and I said, yeah, if it was a, you know, probably, if I haven't, not, not for the last year, not really, but yeah, historically, you know, working out was always a really, really big part of my life. And he said, well, he said, we had to cut through so much muscle <laughs> to get to the, the pericardium and then to get to the heart that it took so long for them to do. He said he'd never seen anything like it. And I certainly aren't, I, I'm definitely not a bodybuilder. I'm definitely not like a really jacked guy. Um, but obviously over the years, I've packed on a bit of muscle, certainly in the chest area, um, and he's just cut all that hard work out. Um, but that's um, obviously causing some of the subsequent pain I've I've got. Whereas if you, uh, certainly when I was younger, none of that was there. And if you may be frail or you're not um, in such good shape or you haven't built that muscle up, um, it would have been a, maybe a bit, a bit easier for him to, to get into. So that was his only real, real comment around uh around the operation was kind of like the entry just took so long he knew it was going to take a while but um, he just kind of reiterated that and it was quite quite short and sweet really um you don't have too well i certainly didn't have too many questions i've got so many questions now you know i'd love to have interrogated him a bit more spoken about the procedure what happens the ins and outs but at that time, I think they capture at the right time because for me, I had no questions to ask the guy. Um, I was just wanted to, crawl, you know, curl up in a ball, just cry and just, you know, just feel better. You know, that's all you want to want to think about. So there was no real questions. Um, they were really happy with um, the heart rhythm after the heart, which was really good. That was the concern. Um, and the potential for having to have a pacemaker. So they actually laid pacing wire. So two, I believe, underneath the heart and two on top of the heart. Um, and they laid those during the procedure and they had them coming out of a hole not too far, I believe, from the chest drains. Um, and they were there purely, they were um, hooked up to a pacemaker um, and they tested them when I was awake, which I wasn't too happy about because they done it quite high and they looked quite shocked that I could actually feel this, uh, the electric current going through the heart. But after that, after they checked that the signals were working, um, they were happy to, um, they had it 
um, on, but it was on quite a low setting or something like that. Um, but they were happy that my heart rhythm was pretty much spot on. It was normal. They hadn't done any damage to that. Um, and they were happy that during the uh, recovery process over the next few days, those uh, pacing wires would be taken out and I wouldn't need a pacemaker, which was absolute result. You know, I didn't really want to have to have a pacemaker as well, as well as warfarin, as well as mechanical valve. And, you know, you just turn into a bit of a uh, walking medical center sort of thing. So I didn't, I was quite, quite pleased um, with that. So yeah, the rest of the ICU stay wasn't actually that long. I was kind of back in the beds, maybe an hour in a chair max. It was just uncomfortable. The bed wasn't much more comfortable, if I'm honest. Um, you just can't get comfortable no matter what sort of, sort of position you're in. You find a sweet spot, it's sweet for five minutes, then you have to kind of keep moving and fidgeting and, and what have you. So it was a bit of a blur, really. Um, I remember the, the ICU, but you kind of just lie there in a bit of a bit of a daze. You're recovering. You're still high on uh, morphine and um, the anaesthetic. And you have like the morphine button um, that you can press. Um, as I mentioned previously, they had to keep telling me to press it because I wasn't pressing it enough, even though I was obviously in pain. It just didn't really cross my mind for whatever reason um, to, to press it. So they were kind of insistent I was pressing that. And that was it really. I don't think much else happened. I had uh, a portable x-ray done. So someone came came round, slid a board behind my back and, and x-rayed me while I was kind of sat up in bed in the ICU. Um, but that was it. They were saying, look, this afternoon you're going to go to the um, HDU, um, which is the high dependency unit. Um, so it's kind of like the step down. It sounds, should be the other way around sometimes, depending on kind of what way you uh, you interpret it, but it's kind of in the UK anyway. And for me, it was ICU, HDU, and then back on general ward. So that was kind of like the step down recovery um, approach. So they said to me that I would be um, on, on the HDU transferred there in the afternoon. So anytime after two o'clock, once they had um, a lunch break was out of the way over there and they had a, and I had a bed, um, they'd move me. So yeah, that kind of come around quite, quite quickly. You're considering I wasn't really doing much in the ICU um, other than kind of just being awake. Um, again, it's kind of, you're, you're in a bit of a daze um, I think I might have taken one photo um, in there. I was planning, like I said, to do loads of videos, but really for me, that was like so far from my mind to pick up my phone and, and, and you know, kind of start filming myself. Um, God knows what I would have said. <laughs> you know, who knows? Who knows what it would have been? But yeah, two o'clock came around pretty quick and they had to transfer me from the ICU bed into like a generic type hospital bed that I kind of stayed in um, for the rest of my stay. You know, it's kind of like similar sort of thing. You can move the back and the legs and, and all of that sort of stuff, but it's not like the high tech air bed type thing that the ICU beds are. And I really, really struggled being moved about. I was in so much pain and I'm not sure how they would do it normally, but they kind of put like, um, like a, a flat board in between the two beds and they were sliding me across and, and all of this, it just seemed to take forever. And I was in so much pain when I was doing it and they were positioning me and, and all of that. That was probably the worst bit about the ICU, you know, just behind kind of waking up and, and having to be chucked in a chair, basically. Um, transferring beds, that was, uh, that was an experience, quite painful. But once I was kind of in that, um, the normal beds, being wheeled to HDU, um, that you say it, it, it was really quick, really quick um, in the scheme of things. Um, I was wheeled down there, I think it's on the same floor. Um, or no, actually, I think it's up a couple of levels, I had to go in a lift, um, had to go up a couple of levels, um, and then into the HDU. And as I was going in there, they were saying that um, I had um, a side room, which was really good. So they put me into like a side room, I had my own room, um, which is fantastic. Uh, they set me up in there um, and I'll go on on another video to talk about um, what the HDU um, was like and what I did on there. But yeah, this kind of 
quick, I say quick, it was 20 minutes, uh, a lot more to speak about than I thought um, about the ICU, um, about what happened um, there. Um, I might come back, add a few things or add some notes um, on the video um, when I get around to, to editing it. But that was pretty much it. I'm going to move on to the, uh, the HDU video now.